Hello and welcome back to this final video on binary text classification for the purposes of the digital humanities using and creating neural networks in TensorFlow and Keras. That is a mouthful. Uh, let's just kind of jump right in. Now in the last video, this is where we left it off. We had a function that allowed for us to create the sequential model in Keras with an embedding layer, a global average pooling 1D layer, three and three dense layers with the sigmoid activation being our output layer. Now the purpose of this was to create a model that could perform binary text classification on Oscar Wilde and Dan Brown and let us know if some unseen data is Dan Brown or Oscar Wilde. And this was the way in which we trained it with the training data that we prepared in video 11b. Now what we are going to do is we're going to add one little bit of code to this because if you remembered, we just simply trained the model. We didn't really return anything so that model's not being saved in memory for us. So we are going to simply return model, add that little bit to this function. Now when we exit that function, we're going to have a model that is trained as an object uh, that's being returned to us. So the next thing we need to do is we need to actually save that model. We haven't done that yet. And if you look over here on the left, you might not be able to see it, but I have a folder called models and a subfolder within that called OB, Oscar Brown, uh, Oscar Wilde, Dan Brown uh, model. And so what I'm going to do is uh, drop the model and, from Keras and save it into that. Unfortunately, that means I have to retrain the model, which is going to take just a little bit of time. But I'm going to jump back to the video after it, uh, before the training stops, starts and then jump back once it's finished. So let's go ahead and just simply write a little bit of code to save the model. We're going to simply save model.save, and you're going to be surprised how easy this is, models ob model. Now it's important that you do not specify a file type, rather make sure that you are specifying folders. So models is the uh, one folder, and then the subfolder of models is ob underscore model. Now when I want to use that model in the future, I can simply do model equals keros, dot models dot load underscore model and you guessed it type in that same directory helps if it's a string <laughs> so models backslash uh, ob model and i'm going to go ahead and run this and then we're going to jump back after the model has been saved okay we're back and now the model has saved you'll notice that in that subfolder ob underscore model we now have a folder called assets a folder called variables and a, a file called saved underscore model dot pb. That's our model. And we know that we were able to lo uh, load it correctly because we didn't get an error when we loaded it. This is good news. This means that at this stage, we can comment all of this out because we don't need it anymore. Uh, because our, actually, we are going to need one thing. We're going to need to save our uh, word index, but we're not going to need a train or create our model anymore. All of that is uh, done. Actually, I'm gonna just leave that right there and we're gonna just comment out the training process and the creation process. There we go. And so now what we're gonna do is we're going to start creating a final function for this video series. It's gonna allow us to test our model on unseen data. So we're gonna have, a, this is gonna look a little more complicated than it really is. All we have to do, fortunately, is simply create a function that's going to be called test model. And this is going to take a few arguments. We're going to pass in the text chunks, and we're going to see what these uh, objects are in just a second when we call this model. Reverse word index model, that's going to be the actual model that we're passing to it. And we need that reverse word index because uh, we want the test to take place with the same word index that the model was trained on. And we're going to say cutoff is going to be equal to zero. All right, so let's go ahead and make an object that's going to be a list. It's going to be called results, and that's going to be equal to an empty list. And then we're going to print off just a simple analysis thing. Oh, helps if you actually type correctly. There we go. Analysis, that's just going to tell us kind of what's happening. And we're going to say for test in text chunks, and then we're going to do... If the length of test, wow, I cannot type today. If the length of test is greater, so greater than two, if the length of test is greater than two, print test, and then we're gonna do predict. Now this is the bit of Keras we're gonna use, model.predict, 
And then we're going to do a list test test. There we go. And then what we're going to do is if predict zero, and that's going to call the first in that index, if predict zero is greater than the cutoff, so in our case, greater than zero, uh, meaning that the prediction is higher than zero because we want to see all the results. We can control that, though, and leave the prediction only at, let's say, 0.99. So we can only return results that meet the prediction that we want to see. We're going to say print. We're going to say prediction. Oop, there we go. Is going to be equal, uh, plus. Let's just do plus instead of an F string. Uh, predict zero. You're going to see what all this does in just a second. And then finally, we're going to do results.append. And we're going to say string. Ooh, string. And we're going to say predict. Index it at zero. And then we are going to say reconstitute text. Remember that function that we made before. And we're going to reconstitute it from the reverse word index. All right, and what that's going to do is that bit of code is going to let us essentially reconstitute the text and take it from a numerical array and put it back into some kind of readable, uh, human readable uh, result, which is going to be essentially a reconstituted series of words or a string. So we're going to return results. We're going to return cutoff so we can kind of store what our cutoff was in memory. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to write a function to write these results to a file. It's always nice to store that outside of Python so you don't have to constantly run it and uh, examine stuff in the console. So we're going to pass in three arguments here. Uh, we're going to pass in results, file name, and name. So we're going to say with open file name, and I've got a problem right now. There we go. That should work now. I had a uh, parentheses missing right there. So now what we are going to do is say with open, and we're going to say file name, and we are going to say file name plus, and we're just going to say txt dot txt because we're going to pass in a file name that does not a, a text file natively, and we're going to say write, and that's going to have an encoding equal to, you guessed it if you've seen my videos, utf8 as f, and we're going to say f dot write. And we're going to add in um, some characters that allow us to recognize what's happening here. So test on, and then we're going to add that in like that. And then we're going to do this, f.write. We're going to make this an f string, and we're going to say name. And that's going to tell us the name that we're actually uh, writing to the file, or the, the name that we want to pass in so we know uh, what file we're looking at. And then we're going to say for result and results f dot write, and we're going to simply write string result, uh, and then we're going to add in a line break. So you're going to see what all that does in just a second. Um, I encourage you to kind of just stick with me, wait till the end of the video, and then go back and see what that code actually did. It'll make a lot more sense in just a few seconds. So now it's time to actually start uh, getting the data for our training data in some kind of testable way. So I've got a set of testing data already prepared for this video. It's embedded in data, and it's testing.txt. And it's just all Dan Brown stuff. So the goal here is to get the model to recognize that everything it's looking at is Dan Brown. And what you're going to see is that it's actually fairly good at doing this, despite the fact that we had minimal training data. So we're going to say t file just like we did before with our training data. It's going to be equal to data.testing.txt. So that's our uh, our testing files. And then we're going to say t text is going to be equal to get data t uh, file. And then what we're going to say is t since we're going to break that down just like we did with all of our training data. Create since and we're going to pass in t text. And then what we're going to do is t pad it. Remember, that's our padding function that allows us to add those zeros or, in our case, question marks to words that it hasn't encountered before. So t sense word index, we're going to pass in that actual index, and we're going to set that max length to 25 once again. So we're going to keep it consistent with what we did earlier. So t pad is going to be equal to uh, padding data. There we go. And now what we're going to do is we're going to start running our test. So let's run the test. And we're going to say test results. 
and we're going to call in that test results function. Oh, sorry, test model. I apologize. So uh, test results. <laughs> Test results is equal to test model. And we're going to call in that test model function that we created just up here. So we're going to pass in total chunks, a reverse word index, the actual model, and a cutoff of zero. But that's a keyword argument, so we might not have to do that. So we're going to say t padded. That's going to be our data that we want to feed into it. The reverse word index is going to be the reverse word index index, which we created in the second video on the series right here. So we just called that reverse word index now, and you finally see it getting used for a, a purpose. And model is going to be equal to model, which is going to be essentially the model that we uh, loaded in right here. We don't need to save that. We just need to load it. So what we're going to do now is call our next function, which is write test here. And then what we're going to do is write test and we're going to say test results zero because it's going to return in the zero index all the results from our test. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say file name is going to be equal to data results and we're going to save that to results.txt and the name is going to be equal to testing.txt. So that's going to be the name of the file where we got all that data. So let's go ahead. This is going to load the model in uh, Keras and then process over all of it. So if you see, it's already running the test and we have an error. Text is not defined. What did I do wrong? If length of text, where are we at? And I called that text instead of test. Now when we run this, it should work just fine. Some of you all might have already seen that and noticed that error in the video. And we have another error, predict function call stack. OK, so once again, I was getting an error. Uh, it was a prediction error. And the reason, once again, was because I was trying to run uh, this whole uh, code on my computer while recording, which is all GPU intensive. And so the only thing I found out was that I accidentally forgot a uh, underscore here. And when I turn off my recording software, it runs correctly. So I'm going to run it again and then show you the results. So once while the model's running and it runs very, very quickly, you should see something that looks like this, a bunch of numerical arrays with a prediction. The prediction, the closer that it is to one, the more likely that what you're looking at is, in fact, Dan Brown. The closer to zero that it is, the more likely that it is that it's Oscar Wilde. So let's go and look at the actual results. So these are the reconstituted results. And again, everything that I'm giving it right now is Dan Brown. So one would expect to see a whole bunch of um, of ones kind of or things that are closer to one with prediction. And we do kind of see this. So if we go down the list, we can see that we have a couple sentences because, again, I wasn't so concerned about proper textual cleaning for this video. I just kind of let it have blank sentences. And you see the model struggling there, uh, leaning 59 to um, Dan Brown. This probably means that when I was processing the data or cleaning the data or preparing the data, there are a couple sentences that were blank and that happened probably more frequently in Dan Brown than it did in Oscar Wilde, which is why the model is more lenient to believe that that is actually Dan Brown. And this is, again, a good example of why cleaning the data and preparing it is so significantly important. But if we go down this list, we see that again and again and again, we see Dan Brown definitely being the more common prediction than Oscar Wilde. And we know this because it's very, very close to one, which is where we want to see it. So why are we seeing this so close to a one? And the reason kind of comes down to something that's very interesting. So what's happening here behind the scenes is that the model is using the embedding layer to create word vectors, essentially, in order to understand what makes Dan Brown Dan Brown and what makes Oscar Wilde Oscar Wilde. It's taking in all of that vocabulary and understanding how each author uses what words, which words are unique to that author and in what context they're being used. And so this is why in certain instances, it's so confident. The word Langdon, which refers to Robert Langdon, the main character and the protagonist in a lot of the Dan Brown novels, is unique to Dan Brown. Oscar Wilde, I promise you, has never in his entire corpus, never wrote the word Langdon. There wouldn't have been a reason to. And so for reasons like that, the model is able to assign this level of accuracy. But even in cases where Langdon isn't used, the model is still able to be somewhat confident. 
Like in this line here, I'm pretty sure you saved ours. Now there's a bunch of stuff that's happening here in the background that's probably leaning it to say that this is Oscar or Dan Brown. It could be the overall syntactical structure. I'm using a contraction here. That might be unique to Dan Brown. Oscar Wilde might not use contractions. I don't know. I didn't look that closely. But my point is, is that the model is able to successfully identify Dan Brown with remarkable consistency. We see some examples that are clearly wrong, but again, this might be the result of a kind of poor data cleaning for this video series. By the way, miss, so we cut off at periods, not actual sentences. So MS here has a period afterward to indicate miss, the abbreviation in English. Had we given it the full sentence and used spacey, which would have been more time consuming for this video series, then we would probably have even better results. The point here wasn't to show you how to get perfect results, rather the methodological steps be and the concepts behind binary text classification. If you use the code in this video, you were going to have to modify it a little bit to tweak it to what you need to see, and I would highly encourage anyone who's watching this and trying to use the code to spend more time on those earlier steps of data cleaning. Specifically, add in a little bit of code using Spacey to actually delineate sentences using another machine learning method. If you're not familiar with Spacey or NLP, I have a whole series on Spacey, and I have a bunch of videos coming out in the near future on training word vectors using the GenSim library. That's going to give a little bit more insight and depth into what is happening behind the scenes, what's allowing the model to essentially assign this level of accuracy to, uh, to its predictions. And even though this is not a state-of-the-art model, even though we had very little training data, we see that the model is able to actually return fairly consistent and fairly accurate results. Now, would I put this on the market and try to publish on this? No, of course not. But that's not the point. The point is demonstrating those concepts. Hopefully, you have a good understanding of what binary text classification is and how it can be achieved using Keras and TensorFlow and how to kind of see these results and start making adjustments to your neural network architecture and your data cleaning methods to get better results. That's going to be it for this video series on binary text classification. Please join me in the next video series, which will kind of continue and pick up right here, where we start exploring the more complex problem of multi-class text classification. Now, this was a very easy example and an easy test. In the next video series, we're going to look at a more complex problem that requires more complex solutions, and it's going to require a bit more finesse and nuance. That's going to be it, though, for now. Thank you for listening, and if you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe down below.